whoever might be listening, whether they're on the land or in a city, and they want to get involved in the environment or in agriculture or in home gardening, just do it. Don't let the future be that time when you wish you'd done what you're not doing now. There's a wealth of information available. Growing your own food is probably one of the most rewarding things there is. I personally would recommend doing it organically and even biodynamically. This podcast series, Queensland Women, Inspiring Stories from Environmental Champions, gives voice to the vital environment support and ecological sustainability work undertaken by inspiring women practitioners, advocates and thought leaders in this state. We hope that it offers our audience and particularly women listeners energising ideas and encouraging role models which can help motivate them as they develop their own contributions toward building a genuinely sustainable future in this place. To be clear, that would be a future based upon much improved levels of human and other species health and well-being, much improved levels of social fairness and an authentic, sustainable economic prosperity which leaves no one behind. The series was produced for Hope Incorporated Australia in Toowoomba, Queensland, on and adjacent to the traditional lands of the Jarawa, Guyabal, Yugara and Waka Waka peoples of the surrounding region. Hope pays respect to the past, present and emerging leaders of all First Nation Australians in this country and celebrates the unique contributions their cultures make to this place. Those contributions include indigenous spiritual respect and care for country, the sovereignty of which was never ceded. We acclaim indigenous stewardship of the nature of Australia, undertaken over many, many thousands of years, and the model that stewardship provides us now in this place, as we survey and attempt to repair some of the environmental damage created by the often misguided development approaches of only the last 200 years or so. Hello and welcome. My name is Andrew Nicholson and I am the producer of the podcast series. In the ongoing development of more intentional, environmentally supportive forms of farming, the practices of organic and biodynamic agriculture have been experiencing ever greater adoption since their first appearance in the early to mid 20th century. Both forms of agriculture can be interlinked to influence progressive systems of environmental and farm management. Organic farming can be described as the practice of producing food of high nutritional quality and flavour whilst avoiding the use of artificial fertilisers and synthetic chemicals, whilst permitting some limited use of naturally occurring pesticides and fertilisers. Biodynamic farming practice can be thought of as a logical and compatible extension of organic methods. It requires a holistic focus, with all aspects of a farm being considered as a tightly interrelated living system, including animals, soils, plants and natural ecosystem processes. My guest in this episode of the series, Louise Skidmore, is highly knowledgeable and skilled in all aspects of organic and biodynamic farming approaches. Along with her partner Randolph, she has been an ACO certified organic biodynamic beef producer since 1990 in the Darling Downs region of Queensland and in Hernani, New South Wales, where biodynamic practice specifically guides the couple's environmental and farm management systems. Louise is also an influential catalyst and change agent within her agricultural sector, holding various not-for-profit board positions, including the Regional Natural Resource Management Body, Biological Farmers of Australia, now termed the ACO, Organic Federation of Australia, and Central Downs and Clifton Landcare. Presently, she is also Treasurer of Clifton Landcare Group Incorporated and Company Secretary for Biodynamic Agriculture Australia. To top off all of these commitments, she also holds qualifications in conservation and land management and company directing and is a general aviation and RAA pilot, owning her own small aircraft for use in inter-farm commuting. So, uh, Louise, after that hugely impressive CV, a very warm welcome. I'm greatly looking forward to talking with you today. Well, thank you, Andrew. I, I barely recognise that person. <laughs> 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 well, 
Well, um, perhaps you'll become more familiar with her as we go through this discussion. <laughs> and let's start that conversation by asking you a bit about your earlier personal history of environmental support interests. Specifically, do you remember how your passion for the environment started? Uh, yeah, well, yes. Um, my Australian husband and I came here to Clifton in 1986. Um, I was a Canadian at the time, um, and I came from a maritime environment in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador, where I'd worked in community development with fishermen groups and then in bilingual education, um, because Canada is a bilingual country. Um, and then in order to get a feel of the environment, new, completely new environment to me, um, we joined the newly formed local land care group. And it that turned out to be a really good way to learn about the climate, the environment, and whatever was likely to hit us in farming on the Darling Downs. I think um, so many of the other guests, I think they're all actually possibly with the exception of one i've had you know considerable experience of land care it just goes to that it reminded me as i've been going through these various ind individual stories how important land care as an initiative in australia has been and still is um <laughs> hearing that you know going back to its early origins in the late 80s and uh but coming all the way up through to the present day so very interesting to hear that you were one of those people as well that, that connected into that yeah, well, I think in those days, that's all there was. Um, I mean, nowadays, there's, you know, a lot lot of different organizations you can belong to, specific ones, you know, no-till farming groups and ag force and what have you. But at that time, um, I think land care was pretty much the only thing. And it was new, too. So it was it was form formation, information, as it were. Mm, yeah, mm. it's interesting for you to be in writing at the ground floor um, start of that of that initiative. Mm. Let's stay with um, earlier times and talking about early formative experiences in a career, profession, a calling, vocation, whatever you want to describe it as. People will often refer to other people who influence them. And so the question now is, is there anyone in particular you remember who inspired or mentored you in your work? Mm, yeah, well, I think the late Keith Banger. He was a foundation member of Lancare. Uh, he, he had a great influence on me. Um, he was a really, really nice guy. Uh, and although our families were poles apart in farming, we were completely different uh, methodologies. He was a great listener. He was a terrific storyteller. He was funny. And he, was a, he had the ability to bring volunteers together on various projects. And that's really, really important for you know environmental group. Um, probably I'd include Robin Lay as well. She She's not here in this area anymore, but she was coordinator for Central Downs Land Care, which was an umbrella group, which included Clifton Land Care at the time. Um, and that was probably in the 90s during the Natural Heritage Trust grant years. Um, I learned from her such a lot, uh, how to write cost and present successful grant applications and coordinate their delivery. And after she, after Central Downs Land Care uh, ceased to be, um, I became a bit of a grant writer uh, for our group, and numerous Clifton landholders benefited through grants that I wrote for them and, and administered through Clifton Land Care. So, yeah, both, those two people, I think, stand out. And interestingly enough, of course, Robin Lay is a guest in this series. Um, she's in in the series about two, two or so episodes back, in a sense. Um, so if people want to follow up her story, which was very interesting and, again, det um, detailed a lot of the work around land care in that period of the late 90s into the early 2000s, um, <clears throat> please look up her episode um, because it's well worth a listen. And I, again, I suppose it just goes to that point, as, as she also mentioned, the ubiquity, the common elements of a land care experience um, for many other guests in the series, as we've already talked about. So look, now coming on to a little bit further into your own personal story, Louise, um, moving on to some of those direct experiences and activities that you started to get your hands on <clears throat> in the earlier times of uh, your work on the land in Australia. Uh, the question is, how did you get involved with the ideas of environmental conservation to begin with in that practical hands-on way? 
Mm. Okay. Well, I guess through membership in Clifton Lane Care, where the focus was on, and, and pretty much here it still is, on soils, erosion control, and feral pests and weed management. Um, when we arrived in Clifton in 86, we decided to abandon conventional farming and we started our organic certification, which we eventually got in 1990. Um, we've since added biodynamic methodology to our, our farm management. Um, and so our farm ceased to be a multi use eroded. Um, cropping and grazing property to being completely grazing. Um, and I suppose that as well as producing beef for the domestic market for income, our focus has been on floodplain management and reducing the impact of fast destructive incoming flows, which are entirely man-made, uh, slowing overland flow, increasing infiltration, catching silt, and delivering water downstream to the next guy in an orderly, non-erosive manner. Um, and I think, I think, the guiding influence for us has been, uh, has always been right then and up now even, is P. A. Yeoman's Key Line Plan. And he first introduced this in 1954 in his book, um, Water for Every Farm, which is still available after many reprints. Uh, his son now uh, sells it online. Uh, that's Ken Yeomans. Um, and his 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 plan made makes so much sense um, when you compare it to the the current um, Queensland government um, adoption of contour banks and waterways. Uh, I think if they'd adopted that plan, we wouldn't have half the erosion that we've got now. Um, so that's fairly important, I think. Um, we need to produce beef for income, uh, but I think our main focus really is is floodplain management, you know, overall. And, and that produces good soil, good cattle, um, good biology, uh, good habitat for all the beneficials. And that, that's pretty much what we do. Just staying with uh, floodplain management at the moment, I mean, you made a comment there about the state government, you know, and the earlier work that's been around for decades, decades, you know, the wisdom of doing something better in terms of a, a landscape or catchment management regime. You know, given the whatever the, your particular take uh, or the listeners take on climate disruption and climate change, the fact is, you know, I think there's a wide scale acceptance that climate regimes are changing there are, um, you know, much. There is much more erratic volatility in, in rainfall patterns and the knock-on effect to the sorts of problematic overland flows that you're, you've been talking about. There, what's your? Do, have you got a sense of how much uh, these ideas about a, a better way of managing um, floodplains is diffusing into the wider agricultural sector? Do you have any sense of the trend on that, or? Ah, uh, I do. I mean, I think if you look at any of the regenerative agricultural gurus at the moment that's pretty pretty current um they're all talking about slowing water um you know yeomans was talking about it in 1954 uh, but but now it, it's become much more mainstream um the i think probably the problem for people who are trying to adopt it is it, it, it's a really big problem and where do you start you know um f I haven't got an answer for many of those places, but um, you just start as you can. You know, if it, if you just start in one corner, well, that's where you start. Yeah, thanks, Louise. Um, now, now moving on it, through the interview, thinking more broadly about your work and professional life experience, which has been, you know, hugely extensive. People sometimes talk about having a light bulb or aha moment in terms of what they are doing. You know, in terms of the impact, um, the value that is coming out of their work. So, if, in your case, was there a specific moment in time or or moments in time when you first realised what impact your work was having in protecting or restoring the environment? Um, well, it doesn't happen overnight, that's for sure. Um, and I think it was gradually revealed to us what we were doing was was working. Uh, like our water holding, the soil was getting better. Water holding capacity was improving. 
uh, we had we now have minimal erosion sometimes none in a flood uh, ground flake cover um, was greater and, and that was reflected in stock health um we do have soil tests from time to time and uh, and our, of course our, we have an annual certification audit um which sometimes requires tests and these are improving so it, it it it's gradual but it it will it will get better i think that's you know that's i can't say there's a moment but it's gradual i just wonder if again staying with this a little bit longer and we are going to touch upon this again i think later in the interview but you you clearly were and i know having talked to you before you you and your partner were agriculture well are agricultural pioneers and innovators but certainly back in the day when you first kicked off on the darling downs and that that whole um theme that's come out of you know quite a few of the interviews so far about influencers as they would now be termed change agents um people who demonstrate different ways of doing stuff and then potentially educate or influence others down that same path what 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 did you want to say something about that role you know, you took took it on in a sense inadvertently to some extent. I mean, I don't think there was a shingle put up outside your house saying, you know, here here is Louise, uh, influ- influencer and innovator and um, change agent. But I mean, what what has it been like to be um, a person in that role? <laughs> to be so to be different. <laughs> um, well, initially, when we decided to uh, abandon conventional farming, we were we were this was you know, mid eighties. We were ostracized. You know, um, locally we were com- considered completely nuts. You know, you can't do it; it won't work. Um, we just persevered. We just kept to ourselves and persevered. Um, but now, uh, well, I think people are just looking at us. Well, I can't say what exactly they're thinking, but uh, we must be doing something right because we're still here. Um, we're not broke. Um, and um, we're making a living, you know, and and we're living we're living well. So, and the ground is and the land is getting better. Mm-hmm. And again, I think that's um, in in that sort of regenerative agriculture, biodynamic, organic agriculture space, whichever particular specialism you're looking at. I mean, I've, again, a number of guests have made this point: the the actual proof of the pudding, in effect is in the demonstration that these people are making a prosperous living off their properties and the properties are improving in terms of, you know, markers like soil health in, in, in the number of ways that you can mm. engage that. So the, 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 the demonstration is there in the actual works as it were. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, moving on then um, you've already started talking about this in effect, but just to sort of reinforce that this point, um, across a long time on the land a number of notable achievements in terms of improving the health of the properties you know making a good living but are there any specific achievements you're particularly satisfied with or proud of and why um i guess there's two aspects to that really um with clifton land care i would say participation in the in the clifton nobby road tree planting project that went on for many years. We weed controlled it for many years afterwards. Too untold hours of volunteer labour went into that, and the stand of trees is now quite mature and looking good. Um, uh, after the demise of Central Downs Landcare, when Clifton Landcare was left on its own, um, I did I did several um, successfully acquitted Enviro Fund grants. For local landholders, uh, which brought them great, great uh, financial assistance to do a project, uh, but terrific benefit for the land. They were predominantly pest and weed control and erosion control things. And and the interesting thing about about government grants is that where you've got uh, a grant amount, there's always a requirement for a landholder to provide a matching amount of of fund whether it's in kind or dollars. I found in every grant that I had anything to do with, landholders well exceeded the amount, the the value of their input. In in some cases, it was four or five times the amount of the grant, 
maybe it was a price on their own labor or their own tractor or whatever, but a little bit of funding to, to pay for expensive, really expensive out-of-pocket things like poison or, or, or a, a contractor is matched by enormous amount of, of, uh, of in-kind by, by uh, landholders. And this, this, this opportunity seems to have disappeared from current grant um, applications. Uh, they either don't recognize it or I've not been able to suss out in the application forms <laughs> where it is. Um, now, the other thing too is we had a lot of grant applications for land care for equipment. Uh, that we need for feral pest control, um, we've we got a um, we've got some very high tech pig traps, which are operated remotely, um, operated remotely through cameras and SIM cards in camera and your phone, so you can be you know at home, and your pig trap could be miles away, um, and you've got a lot of pigs in it. You can operate the gate. And then, of course, you can get down and dispose of the pigs. And pigs are a big problem around here. Um, and then, uh, I guess, uh, as treasurer of Clifton Landcare for many years, managing financials, insurances, policies, grant funds, bank accounts, investments, tax and what it's. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty good at that. And we are pretty financial. So uh, I'm quite pleased about that. Um, and then also for Clifton Landcare is, is uh, sussing out and finding John Fian, uh, who is a retired dung beetle expert, and bringing him out to our community. Subsequently, we conducted several releases of thousands of dung beetles. Now, I can't underestimate the, the value of a dung beetle. They are the most valuable workers a grazier can have. Um, they, they're tirelessly recycling dung with multiple benefits to the soil. You could do a whole podcast on dung beetles, Andrew. Uh, they're just the most fantastic creatures. Uh, and they, are, they ask for nothing but a pile of dung. Um, and last year, we, on, a, on this farm, we were excited to, to, uh, to find that we had a good population of a winter active beetle, Onitis kaffa. Um, and apparently, uh, John Fian um, released quite a lot of these uh, about 40 years ago in some place north of Toowoomba. And that area is now a suburb. Um, and these appear to have migrated from there. So it's really good to find them because there's a dearth of dung beetles, uh, winter active dung beetles. So uh, it was terrific to find them here. And then with Lancare too, another project I'm heavily involved in is um, is the protection of the critically endangered bull oak jewel butterfly. Um, just before COVID, we got a few grant funds from Toowoomba Regional Council to establish a, an exclusion fenced habitat near Leeburn. And it's it's on council land. Uh, so it's never going to, hopefully never going to be built on. Um, and it's an ongoing project um, under the guidance of of Dr. Don Sands, who's an ex sirio entomologist, uh, and he's champion of bullet jewel. And this this butterfly is now critically endangered. Um, it was endangered when we started, and now it's become critically endangered. Um, and where where uh, we had a field trip down there last week, uh, and it's the fence is holding up. It's uh, it, no, nothing has been getting in there, which is great. Um, and it's very important that nothing gets disturbed on the ground because the butterfly has a has a relationship with an ant um, that protects its that protects its larvae, and the ant does not like to walk on soil, so it's important to leave all the twigs and branches and bits of wood and and boughs that fall down. It's important to leave them there so that the ant has got a highway between trees. Um, and we're currently looking at enlarging that habitat with some more fencing. Uh, and Dr. Sands is currently developing a plan and management committee, which will include our group. So, so this is going to be a, a long-term project for our land care group, this, this bullet jewel butterfly.
habitat. So I really, I'm, 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 I, I seem to be focusing on insects, but, <laughs> but they are very, very important. Um, and then on our farm, my my partner Randolph Olson um, does most of the work, of course, um, being the farmer. Um, and we our our plan is to leave it in a much much better condition than when we arrived. Um, and refencing in the direction of overland flow, protecting the riparian zones and the springs, rotational grazing, resting paddocks. Um, and then t- about 10 years ago, we, we began using biodynamic preps to further enhance soil health. And we learned how to make our own horn manure and horn silica preparations. That, that's 500 and 501. Um, ideally, these are sprayed over the farm at least twice a year, broadcast more than sprayed. Um, though last year we didn't because it was too wet. Um uh, we run a, a 95% enclosed system. We don't overstock, and we don't import grain or hay, even during droughts. If if we, in a in a in a bad drought, we will destock before we before we have to before they lose condition. Um, we do bring in certified organic lick blocks, which are available all the time to the stock as they wish. Um, and the only import is we have is bulls. Every couple of years, we bring in a new bull, and they're not certified. Uh, the rest of the herd is certified and raised on farm. And we mostly sell in autumn or early winter. Uh, and because our production expenses are so low, uh, and apart from freight and sales fees, about 95, 90, 95% of the sales income is ours as profit. So it it it's not what you get; it's what you end up with, <laughs> as far as profit is concerned. You can <clears throat> you can probably put a lot more stock on this place, spend a lot more money bringing in feed, and not make as much money, and and do a lot of damage to the ground too. So that's pretty much it, I think. Well, uh, Louise, there was so much there. <clears throat> but attempting just to pull a, a few points out of that, so as a second order level for listeners, I think a lot of that, to my mind, as a lay person listening to that, links to there's one very strong the- um, theme around environmental stewardship, looking after the country and landscapes, the floodplain management you've mentioned, <clears throat> in 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 light, well, a- amongst other things, in the enlightened self interest that if you look after the land, it will look after you. Um, I've heard this theme repeated a number of times by other um, uh, guests in the series. If you look after the soil health, if you look after the <clears throat> integrity of the natural systems that underpin the agricultural systems that you rely on, then surprise, surprise, they're going to look after you. So um, and there's a very strong theme coming out of that for you. Mm. But it goes beyond that, doesn't it? Because, you know, linking through that land care. Um, those land care initiatives, the fact that, you know, a group, a, a local community would spend time and interest on on attempting to uh, preserve a, a butterfly. You know, the, and the average punter out there listening to this might think, well, you know, a butterfly. But if you have some awareness, as I'm sure your communities do, of the interconnected chain of life, you know, that holistic principle that everything is connected to everything else, the, the natural world is connected to the economy, which is connected to the social health of the community. Or at the biggest picture level, you know, environmental health and well-being of the physical environment around us equates to human health and, and well-being. If the if the physical environment around us is degraded and going down the tubes, then so will we uh, at that bigger picture level. And I think you're touching upon all of that. The same thing with the dung beetle. Um, the fact that you know, and I, I was thinking of an uh, uh, irreverent um, compar- analogy here. Perhaps this is the wrong way to put this, but it seems that the lowly literally lowly, um, under-acknowledged and underappreciated dung beetle might stand as a metaphor for a lot of some of the, the, the work of the guests that I've been talking to in this series, which has also been under-acknowledged and undervalued. The, <laughs> the, cru- the crucial environmental protection work that they're doing, which is adding so much to Australian society, to the health uh, of its populations, you know, the human populations, but you know, doing that through an understanding, a clear understanding that the health of a natural world is absolutely key to the health of the human world. 
<clears throat> the other point I'd like to ask you about is I know that you are a savvy, clearly, you know, as you as you talk uh, in, in this segment, you're, a, you're savvy about the management, the economic management of the landscape as well. And, and you're in that business of making a living out of the landscape. So you, you, you would need to be. But going back to that aspect of grant funding, again, it's a theme that's come out from a number of guests. I just wondered if you wanted to say something further about that. The, the, the increased difficulty, and I've heard this okay, from several interviews, the increased difficulty of, of applying for grants, the complexity of the application process going up seemingly all the time. And as a result, some bodies, some land care bodies, frankly, and other groups have folded um, and fallen by the wayside as a result of the difficulty of getting that funding. I'm I'm always interested in the why of stuff as well as the actual you know the how uh, and other other aspects. I mean, what is that about? Is it is it about the fact that there's a, a a static pot of money that that many many more people are applying for? Is it down to um, bureaucratic incompetence in the sense of the way this stuff is allocated? I mean, do you have a view about any any aspect of that? Well, I totally agree that it's becoming increasingly difficult to to put in applications i mean you don't how, how, it's the regulation i think that has that has uh, that has been overdone on this um i think too that they're very very aware grant givers of, of governments i suppose you might say are very aware now that they have to justify every cent that they hand out and that the, the the group or the recipient has to has to monitor and report on every every skerrick of work they do and this is actually quite difficult for an ordinary land care group or an ordinary landholder um i mean yes you can say i spent x dollars on doing this uh, and they want to know what are the, what are the benefits how long will they last i mean these are questions you just can't answer um and and uh, while you can do your own um, on on farm monitoring or or on on locality monitoring um it's really a matter of opinion um so i find that the monitoring part of the of the grant application could do with a real overhaul um while while we while we want to know that the things that we're spending taxpayers' money on are doing some good. The, the the kind of detail that people sitting behind desks in Canberra want to know are, are often impossible to answer. Um, so I I just feel that possibly they need some field officers that that can that can actually come and help or 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 guide groups or landholders to fill in monitoring forms. I don't know, but it, it has become increasingly difficult to get funds and increasingly difficult to fulfill the requirements of those those you know successful applications. So I suppose probably quite a few people have been giving the money back. You know, in a world where I look, I, I, I'm a lay person, and to be honest, it's not an area that's vastly interesting to me because I think it often does so get caught up with bureaucratic intransigence and the political vagaries of viewpoints of what matters. But whilst one has to, you know, respect the ideas of due diligence, you know, acquittal of funds, as you as you seem to point out, um, you know, this is becoming a, a bureaucratic exercise. When in fact, one one gets the impression that in the wider society millions and millions of dollars if not billions are, are thrown around um with a, with a much more cavalier attitude it would seem i mean who's doing the due diligence on you know the, the huge amounts of money that get transferred to activities that don't seem to produce a lot of value so i i mean I, ultimately it seems to come down to what is valued in society who values it who makes the assessment but that that idea of more on the ground scrutiny almost perhaps going back in time to uh, what I've heard, you know, when there were perhaps more workers on the ground, you know, through um, land care and um, natural resource management stuff, funding especially, perhaps we need to go back to that idea, scrutiny and monitoring of, of stuff actually on the ground in the communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. We used to have, we used to have a DPI guy stationed right here in Clifton. Um, and he, he serviced Warwick and, and uh, Cambuya towards to I'm not towards Toowoomba, 
a big area, but he was there for advice and he was there for, you know, helping with various things that you, that that an individual or a group might need some guidance on. Now, there's that's none of that now. I mean, you never see getting somebody out of their Toowoomba office these days is just about impossible. So, I mean, I'm not being critical of the people in the Toowoomba office, but it, the, the positions have been have been abandoned. Mm, mm. Again, it seems to be you know what what is valid and, and something as basic as monitoring. I mean, the same thing goes for environmental protection legislation. The enforcement of that, you know, time and time again across the country, you hear about the fact that. There might be legislation on the books in terms of catchment management issues like the Murray Darling or something like that comes to mind, you know, water allocations or whatever. But there's not enough monitoring on the ground to actually in- enforce legislative requirements. So it's basically yeah. often open slather, you know. So it's just a, a nonsense, really, as to why that doesn't take place. But I can only assume it's ultimately about political valuation or the lack of it. Yes, I think so. So thanks for that, Louise. Look, so we've been talking about trends um, across, you know, that 30 year period, that very long experience um, that you've had on the land, uh, environmental protection experience in various capacities, what's worked well, perhaps what's worked less well in terms of some of the processes. That leads us nicely, I think, into the next question on challenges you have faced, because I suppose in your sense, it can't have all have been a biodynamic multi-species field of opportunity. Inevitably, there must have been a few obstacles along the way. So, what have been some of the challenges you have faced across your agricultural career and how have you overcome them? Okay. Well, initially in the 80s, uh, um, organic was associated locally with long hair and dope. Uh, so we had to uh, ride that one. Um, we actually got um, reported on uh, uh, whatever that line is that you call in to dob someone in that we were growing marijuana. Um, sometime during the 80s, and we had a visitation of five big four-wheel drives with uh, federal cops and drug folk in it, and uh, they inspected the entire farm and uh, found nothing, of course. But when they first arrived, my husband opened the gate and let them in, and uh, I was up in the shed chasing a snake, and uh, I had my hoe, and uh, he hollered at me from the house and said uh, um, we've got uh, visitors um, and uh, so I proceeded to walk down there towards them and one of them walked towards me and uh, Randolph hollered at me it's the drug squad and I yelled back you've caught me at it because I caught had my hoe and of course when I got closer to this guy and saw saw his little motif of a marijuana leaf on his shoulder and his drug squad thing on the other one. I thought, oh, God, what is this? Anyway, uh, they were they were quite friendly. And, and I, 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 we learned afterwards that our local policeman, who they have to report to first, he told them they were wasting their time. But, um, yeah, they wasted much of a – most of the morning touring everything, and then they left. But, you know, that was the kind of thing that people did in those days and dog people in. It was ridiculous. Um, I don't think it would happen today. Um, and then uh, I guess, you know, initially people didn't really think we were doing the right thing. Uh, you know, we, we were reluctant to open drains up uh, because they just make, you know, deep eroded gullies. Um, and those practices that we did we did then uh, are now endorsed by derm as recommended floodplain management um and that wasn't the case then so most of the work was was and an, was achieved by my partner by by randolph but um, we we did plan it together and and you know a lot of the country around here is still riddled with man-made devices and drains which concentrate and speed up over overland flow um which just causes erosion and spreads it out instead of spreading it out and maximizing infiltration. Um, maybe this will change if we get a new generation of landholders, younger ones, because uh, some of them are too long in the tooth, I think, to, and reluctant to change their ways or visualize the benefits of, of a different perspective. Uh, but really, it's becoming increasingly 
obvious that we need to, when water falls on our farm or runs past it, we need to keep as much of it as we possibly can on the farm and let it sink in. I think those are probably the, the probably the, the 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 biggest thing was was we were different. That's that was what was weird, um, and we weren't part of the, uh, you know, the the uh, the general adopted methodology, which was conventional, very conventional, and not not forward thinking either. But uh, there you go, we got over it. We're, we're still we're still not locals. But we're getting there. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what there is. Um, I just think that, thank goodness, you weren't conventional, you know what I mean? Because uh, by definition, you wouldn't have been necessarily so much of, a, if at all, an in innovator, you and your partner, and a, um, a catalyst for change. Interesting marker of potential progress there, you know, in terms of that fantastic anecdote about the false alarm on the marijuana side of stuff. I mean, perhaps we have progressed as a mm. society after all, you know, that's an interesting, you know, the cops won't be coming anytime soon, perhaps. Um, but just coming back to that, <clears throat> that aspect, again, throughout this interview, you're talking about these really uh, fascinating um, innovations that you've brought into managing the landscape that managing your farm managing the soils managing the health of the natural system surrounding that and i just um, just to stay with that again because i think it is so valuable as with other guests on this series you're bringing in um you know through your own practice but it is diffusing to a wider you know um set of practitioners on the, on the land you're bringing in new approaches that work more effectively and more efficiently because they work with nature as opposed to dominating it that's my sense of it as a lay person Absolutely. Going back to that previous question, we didn't really t touch upon this so much, but the idea of the 95% enclosed system, uh, perhaps you could just expand a little bit on that, on why that is such a good demonstration of the benefits of using holistic integrated approaches to farming and land management, whether that be closed loop or otherwise. Do you want to say a, a little bit more about that? Well, um, I don't know what else I can say about it. It's It's... If you start with good stock, um, then you can maintain a, a herd of cows. Uh, you've got to cull those that obviously are not going to produce properly um, and bring in a bull every now and again, or m more bulls, put it that, that way. Um, but y your expenses are so much lower, you know, uh, and if you, you don't overstock, and you maintain a herd that will that will survive on what land you have, whether it's four hundred acres or forty thousand acres. Um, the the principle is that you 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 minimising your expenses, and you're you're maximising what you get out of the sale of your of your product, whether it's a crop or a stock or a stock or whatever. So the, the fewer expenses you have, the more you the more you will make from that, you know that uh, initial investment in in animals, um, and of course with organic anything that we bring in we have to quarantine. So you know we don't really want to be messing about um, quarantining cows and steers and such like. Uh, we can produce them. So we just have bulls, which we bring in, and we have a quarantine paddock, which they live in for a bit until they're they're acceptable to our organic cows, and uh, and then we let them out. But um, I, I think it's it's really an econ. It's, it, yeah, I guess you could say it's economic, um, and it's tidy, you know. Uh, not having to you know worry about where this stock came from, where that one is. It works. It works for us anyway. Now, having listened to this again through some of the interviews, just again drawing out some of the bigger picture themes. You know, these these agricultural models, the one that you run, the one that other people, other guests have run. You know, and talked about. Again, as a layperson looking at this, it just seems to me I'm picking out these ideas that you know here's almost the paradoxical idea that you can have lower environmental impacts in terms of the agricultural models that you're using, but in fact 
you can still have good profitability, good profit margins. The the contrast with that type of model to industrial scale agriculture that that sort of views the land as simply a resource to be exploited to the max, um, and you know the history of overstocking that goes back uh, many many decades in Australia. Again, as a layperson, you know knowing something about that, but the massive impacts on soil erosion and stuff like that 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 can mm. come out of that. So this these models that are are being described in this series regenerative agriculture, organic agriculture, biodynamic agriculture, these these are more successful models that, as a layperson, you know, they work with the natural systems. Uh, that's my sense. Is, is that correct, Louise? Is that a correct way? They of- do. They do. And absolutely. And and I think we've got to keep in, in our mind, utmost in our minds too, is that what we are putting on the land is not a native animal. It's a cloven-hoofed animal that is very destructive. So. We don't need to overdo it, <laughs> and we need to we need to rotation rotationally graze them so that every paddock they're in gets a chance to recover. That its biology gets a chance to recover from from their activity on it, and that's where the dung beetles come in because they remove all that all that dung. And of course, the dung beetles didn't originate here because our native dung beetles are not interested in cow shit. We had to bring in dung beetles that were specific to, you know, bovine animals. And they 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 help to regenerate a, a paddock at rest. Um, you know, it, it's it's just everything works together in a in a in a circular fashion. But you know, I was gonna say, you know, Cattle are very nice, and they do provide an income, but they're terribly destructive. Again, it's that you know that bigger picture element of what is appropriate to the um, the nature of Australia. Actually, I, I just love the idea that the native dung beetle, in effect, you could argue, sort of jacked up at the idea of doing work that it wasn't actually fit to do because it didn't evolve didn't evolve That's with right. remove animals. I um, mean, it, it just didn't. And you know, we we have in Australia four hundred species of native dung beetles, four hundred, and they don't like mm. cattle shit because they didn't grow <laughs> up with it. In effect, you know, they didn't evolve with it. Yeah, no, yeah. no, no. So no. coming back to um, innovation, it, you know, what is appropriate, um, better systems of doing stuff. You, you know, you you've overcome these challenges. You've stuck with you stuck to your guns, you know, with this fantastic innovative work you've done um, over the years. You've come to build this, you know, very successful life on the land, and I also get the impression that your work over that time has had great meaning and fulfilment for you personally, and no doubt your partner. But we're talking about you in this interview. And given that work in general is such an important component of many of our lives, or at least you know, a vocation or a calling is important. What we do day to day. I wanted to ask you to unpack the idea of the the idea of the sort of quality of work and its satisfaction and fulfillments a little more. So the question here is, in your particular case, how do you feel that your work across your various agricultural roles has influenced your well-being, motivation and determination to keep doing what you do? I guess what has made me happy, okay? So I'm I'm pretty pleased that I've been able to help a lot of local landholders make improvements to their land. Um, including them in projects, writing grants which subsidise their work, which and that that work wouldn't have got done had that not happened. Um, I'm pleased to have been the I'm proud of being the driver uh, and organised Clifton Landcare's Bull Oak Butterfly project. Um, that that has been good and that's going to continue because um, we're 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 still working on that one. Um, and uh, also releasing releasing dung beetles has has been an achievement um we've put them out on eight properties now um and we've had john fian here um giving us a workshop and we're angling to get him back again um but he doesn't like the cold so we'll have to wait until <laughs> we'll have to wait until spring <laughs> um and and also I work I work pretty closely and I'm happy to work with our chairman who's Clive Strong. Um and we have on our land care group a lot of excellent equipment, a multi farming systems planter, 
which is a it's a you know um i can't describe it properly but it, it doesn't disturb the land it just plants right into debris um a seed spreader potty putt keys for planting trees a, a wombat tree hole digger which is a brilliant thing that you have to get a bobcat to drive but it makes the most perfect tree preparation hole um we've got a trailer mounted quick spray black light cameras for observing what pests and even wildlife you might have um and then our, our recently acquired remote control pig traps so all those things are are in our pest and weed control um uh section um but uh, you know we we we're very pleased to have the two environmental aspects the butterflies and the dung beetles that we're still we're still angling to get more and more work done on those projects um that's my that's my parrot i'm sorry about that <laughs> <laughs> and another source of satisfaction. <laughs> I tell you what, Louise. I, I mean, just listening to that, no wonder. I mean, the range of environmental protection roles and enhancement work that you you've covered there. You know, no doubt that that's an explanation of why you have had a great deal of fulfilment and satisfaction from this work. As with other guests in this series, I've I've also sort of you know just put a, a bracket around this this sort of uh, area because I'm thinking that. And I've said, under the current circumstances of national and global environmental decline, sadly, perhaps one of the most important job sectors, callings or vocations that anyone could be involved in is environmental protection work of, of those various kinds. Although, uh, unfortunately, it's not always properly valued by wider society. Just to quickly go through some of those roles you've mentioned there, you know, acting as a facilitator, helping to educate and res resource other individuals and groups to achieve significant environmental protection outcomes, acting as a nature steward, helping to support critically endangered species, demonstrating the environmental protection role that farmers can and do play, can and do play as good stewards of nature and wildlife, and, and as an innovator, as we've already described in this um, interview, being prepared to pioneer and promote new ideas, methods and approaches to improve forms of environmental support, which, which also benefit yourselves and the local communities in terms of economic prosperity. So, I mean, what's not to like about that rich smorgasbord of work that you've undertaken? And I think this is a great advert, hopefully, for listeners who might be thinking about moving into some form of environmental protection work, which we'll, which we'll come to again right at the end of the interview. But moving now through this, towards the end of this fantastic interview, Louise, um, and, and this is probably a silly question to ask you, given the, the actual busyness that you've described there, and I know that you're still across so many other things but the question specifically here is are you working on any current exciting projects um it, we've just had our our bus trip um tour to uh, the butterfly habitat um so i'm not working on that at the moment but i have been until recently um we also spent the morning there and the afternoon at peter ramsey's property uh, near inglewood where he's doing a lot of regeneration work using a multi-farming system planter which uh, was pretty pretty interesting actually. We had a we had a full bus and several cars in in pursuit. So that was good. Good shout out for that. Um, and um, I suppose the next thing is going to be um, oh well. Right now we're organising a a, a a purchase of a, a defilibrator for um, placement in the community. Um, it, it's just something that. Clifton Lang uh, Clifton Lancare can afford, and our um, local ambulance committee wants. Um, so they put the word out to various organisations that they were looking to put these up on the wall, say of the post office, of the local store, of uh, somewhere in Leyburn, and you know, in various places. And these defilibrators are just brilliant for immediate help if uh, somebody has a as a, a an attack um so we we we've we're doing that um but actually uh, there's not we're waiting now for the for the butterfly um management plan and committee to get get organized uh i've got a 
run down someone in Toowoomba Regional Council to uh, see if we can enlarge our butterfly habitat area. That's pretty much what I'm working on, uh, as well as, you know, doing the books for the monthly meetings. Clearly, you're still in the thick of it, as they say, uh, Louise. And just taking one point out of that last um, little co- set of comments there, Again, the whole is, the holism, the holism principle extends throughout your work and and so many other 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 guests in this series. I mean, just that little vignette about the defibrillators, defibrillators, however you pronounce that word, um, the um, preventative health devices in case of heart attack. You know, you, you are working across not just the environmental protection side, but you are you know intimately connected to the social well being and health of your community as well as the economic prosperity of it, you know, managing funds, you know, distributing funds. So there's another, inter, you know, example of that integration of, of environment, social society and economy. And you're doing that just quietly behind the scenes. And again, it's a theme of holistic integration that's come out from a number of um, guests in the series in a number of different ways. So it, it does seem to have been an overarching theme. So finally, Louise, um, as we come up to the end of this great interview, a last couple of questions for you. Um, you know, the, the ability to link into some of your fantastic experience, um, l- listeners going away from this podcast, you know, what might they take away from this? First question is, do you have any advice, especially for women? I mean, hopefully this is a generic audience listening to this, but women particularly who might want to step up into some form of the role, roles that perhaps you've served, you know, in biodynamic farming, natural system restoration, regeneration, wildlife conservation or any other protection uh, or an environment support role in the future? Do you have any specific advice for them going forward? Yes, there are, you're going to provide some links, I hope, at the end of this podcast, which will lead people to uh, find out more about biodynamics. And biodynamics is a wonderful way of home for home gardening too. You don't have to be a farmer to to uh, to produce biodynamic food, and it is wonderful, uh, and it's very very inexpensive to. Uh, to 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 do um but they can find that out through through a, a link to a appropriate site um i think if if people actually want to physically do something they need to volunteer in an area that they think they might enjoy um get hands on experience um if it's not as they imagined well they can change do something different um and if it's if, if it's a younger person who's looking you know looking towards a career something fulfilling and that has to be fulfilling because you can spend a lot of your life at work um make sure they enjoy it and, and it's way more important to enjoy it than than what you might earn um so and i suppose linked to that too is get educated if you're a young person and you want to be in in uh, in natural systems or or wildlife conversa- con- conservation uh, formal ed- formal qualifications will accelerate your progress, um, and just just I guess just do it. <laughs> I've he- I've heard that again. That principle of just get on and do it again. That's come out almost through every. Yeah, wasn't it one of the philosophers? I'm sure loads of people have said it, but Gota or something. You know, said there's mag- magic or something in in taking immediate action or something like that. But it, it's been reprised. Would well, you know? Andrew, I've got a little thing sitting on my computer screen here that has been there probably since about, well, ever since we had a computer, would have been the late 80s. And it says, a big smiley face, don't let the future be that time when you wish you'd done what you're not doing now. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a really good one. And I have I thought, that is so true. I'll hang yeah. that up there. And I did. Well, Hopefully, people might you know print that off, uh, write that down, print that off, and it, you know that epigram will get up onto other people's um, computer screens or their or their walls. Um, but you know, just going back to what you said there, Louise, I'm I'm hearing from that that you know possibly one way of phrasing it, find ways to get you know info an informal taster. This is for people that perhaps you know are coming into the field for the first time. Try out you know experiment basically. Um, have an informal taster. Keep track of personal satisfaction levels at work we spend a lot of time there you know so in other words you know don't be a square peg in a round hole might be another way of putting that Mm. um just find what you find the niche that well aligns with who you are as a person your values your vision for what you want to achieve 
and that way you will be fulfilled. You know, there will be an intrinsic fulfillment going on there. Hopefully, I'm thinking one day all work might fall into those categories because, you know, we hear sadly through surveys, quite a lot of people in the Australian context and elsewhere around the world don't have that type of work. They don't work in fulfilling roles. They don't find a great deal of satisfaction coming out of their daily grind. So um, I think very valuable advice you've given there. And Louise, now for the very last question of this of this interview, you, you've just given us so many ideas to think about. Is there any sort of like catch or brief comment that you could give to summarize some of the points you've made today to act as a sort of, you know, take home message for the audience out there in, in cyberspace or podcast land? Well, I, I, I guess whoever, who, whoever might be listening, whether they're on the land or in a city, and they want to get involved in the environment or in agriculture or in home gardening, just do it. There's a wealth of information available. Um, I personally would recommend doing it organically and even biodyna- biodynamically. Growing your own food is probably one of the most rewarding things there is. Uh, if you're on the land, take a take a, 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 a an aerial view of your farm and look at where can I start to improve the management of the soil, the overflow, the the overland flow. Uh, is there any erosion that I can start to fix up? Um, is no good turning your back on it because it just gets worse. Um, and good luck. <laughs> Louise, um, you know, seize the day, get on with it, just do it. Some great parting reflections there from you as a way of wrapping up this great interview. It's been a real delight to talk with you today. I'm sure you've given our audience great ideas, which may help inform their own thinking about possible next steps toward helping build a genuine, ecologically sustainable future in this place. For instance, through starting their own conversations on the agriculture-oriented environment protection topics we've mentioned in this discussion with their friends, families, colleagues within employing organizations or in their professional associations. But for now, Louise, on behalf of my podcast support organization, Householders Options to Protect the Environment, I just want to thank you so warmly for our discussion today. Thanks, Andrew. It's it's been quite an experience and quite enjoyable. Thank you. You've been listening to a podcast episode in the series Queensland Women, Inspiring Stories from Environmental Champions. The series was produced for Householders Options to Protect the Environment Incorporated as part of the Queensland Women's Week 2023 event and it aligns with the objectives of the Queensland Women's Strategy 2022-2027. to Hope thanks the Queensland Department of Justice and Attorney General's Office for Women and Violence Prevention for the generous funding support which made this podcast project possible. Please consult the episode text notes for possible follow-up material on topics discussed and any relevant contact details should you wish to respond to anything you've heard. And if you enjoyed this episode, please consider promoting it across your networks and giving it a positive rating in your preferred podcast app. My name is Andrew Nicholson, producer of the series, and thank you for listening.